So let's talk about this VO2 max test because we're going to talk about okay. what it means and and you know how predictive it might be of an individual's uh, mm -hmm. mortality. So let's just start by um, explaining to people what you do when a person comes into the lab. Right. So what you do is you get them on a bike or a treadmill, you put some EKG electrodes on them, and they either run on the treadmill or ride a bike, and they have a nose clip on if you're going to measure it directly, and, and either a face mask or a, a mouthpiece that they breathe. And that allows us to measure how much oxygen they breathe in, or air they breathe in, how much air they breathe out. We know that the air has 21% oxygen coming in. If we measure the amount of oxygen in the expired air, we can make an estimate of how much oxygen has been consumed. And so what happens is when people start to exercise, they go from using about three and a half mLs per kg per minute. So think about, you know, or, or maybe 250 mLs or 300 mLs, so like 10 or 12 ounces of oxygen per minute, right? And an unfit, you know, person in their 30s or 40s can typically increase that about eight or tenfold to say in, in, in to, to say, uh, 30 um, or 35. Yeah, to 30. And that would be that would be 30 or 35 or about three liters a minute. Right. And with training, most people can increase things at least 10 or 20 percent. And if you have some ability and or you train very hard, some people can almost double it. And so what happens is that once your VO2 max goes up again, just like physical activity, it's a measure of, of physical fitness, and it's also linked to all-cause mortality. So people, the fitter you are, the, the lower your chance of dying in the next year, two years, five years, 10 years. And it's it, for many years, they thought the thing sort of plateaued at what they call about 10 or 12 mets. A met mean your resting metabolic rate. So you had to be able to get 10, 10 mets, and 10 mets is being able to run one mile in about 10 minutes, roughly, for the average person. And, and now people have shown a group in, in, in Henry Ford in Detroit have shown that that continues to rise even up to 15, 16 mets. So people that are quite fit continue to, to, to gain, uh, you know, benefit in terms of all cause mortality. I mentioned the, the cross country skiers earlier. And while they didn't do VO2 max tests in those people, the people who had completed the most races and done the races the fastest. So people who had both been active for the longest period of time and probably were the fittest, also had lower, lower all-cause mortality than people who had not, not compared to sedentary peers, but compared to people who'd done a few races a little bit slower. So yeah, peak fitness matters. Yeah, when we look at that, that there, so there's a paper in JAMA that I think is by far the most yep. compelling uh, description of this phenomenon. A couple things are noteworthy about it. And I, I've talked about this on a previous AMA yep. because it's, it's really one of the, I would consider it one of the 10 most influential papers that I um, ha have read in terms of changing how I think about, uh, you know, health span and lifespan. Um, as you said, the relationship is monotonic and it does not plateau. So Correct. it's, that, that's a, that's an important thing to, to appreciate, which is this is a more is better phenomenon. And very few things in physiology are more is better. Yeah. Usually physiology behaves in use and upside down use or maybe j's and things yeah, like or, that or or, or, or you know, plateaus S or whatever yeah, yeah correct curves, yep. exactly sigmoid curves but this is not the case here this study that we're talking about put people into the bottom 25th percentile you know 25th to 50th percentile yep. 50th to 75th and then the last group it basically divided into you know 75th to 97 and a half and then they had that little sliver of people that they right. called elite that were at the top two and a half percentile and all cause mortality just went lower and lower and lower and lower. Correct. And if you looked at the hazard ratio the other way, because we often think about hazard ratios in risk reduction, but if you look about it in risk increase, when you compared the people in the top two and a half percent uh, of the VO2 max to the bottom 25%, the hazard ratio moving in that direction was 5.04, yeah. if my memory serves me right. correctly. That means there's a five fold increase in all cause mortality between the fittest two and a half percent and the least correct 25 percent and even when you took something less extreme i believe if you looked at the least fit 25 percent 
to the third quartile, so the 50th yep. to the 75th percentile, the hazard ratio was still about just, just below three. I think it was 2.75-ish, which yep. was kind of right on par with the increase in mortality that you would see from uh, having end-stage renal disease, which is, by the way, greater than the hazard ratio associated with smoking. Yeah, no, no. If being unfit is an incredible risk factor. You know, and, and people like Frank Booth have argued that that it, it should be, you know, for lack of a better word, the risk factor. And Jill Barnes, one of my fellows at the time, she's now at the University of Wisconsin, a faculty member. She and I wrote wrote a um, wrote a editorial for Mayo Clinic Proceedings maybe five, 10 years ago, where we said, look, if people had, you know, 12, 13, 14 met peak exercise capacity, other than doing cancer screening, you could probably just ignore everything else. Now, you know, I mean, I mean and that, that's a little bit, I don't think anybody's ready to go there, the sorts of people who do health screening and that sort of thing. But if you screened people for physical fitness, and again, just did the routine kind of cancer screening, and you could even argue that you could probably cut back on the routine cancer screening for most things, except for uh, skin cancers, because uh, fit people tend to be outside a bit more. You can make that argument. Yeah, you can I make mean, it with a straight face and, and the data is there to support it. And I would belt and suspenders it and say, but look, I'd still do the cancer screening. I'd still consider yeah. aggressive lipid management and things like that. But but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's really no intervention that we have that's going to rival it. Well, and, and I think I think you mentioned lipids, uh, Peter, and I think there's a couple of things you got to remember. One, especially for people who pick it up late in life, you know, exercise is not a vaccine. And, and one of the, the most incredible studies ever done, again, we're talking about these sort of one in, in of one experiment of nature sorts of things, is there was a man named Clarence DeMar. He won the Boston Marathon seven times. He was born, I think, in 1888 or 1890. Also won a medal in the 24 Olympics, got a bronze medal in the marathon. And he really is almost like master athlete number one. So he mm -hmm. kept training his whole life. Ended up dying, I think, of stomach cancer or, or, uh, at about age 70. So he didn't live to be a gazillion. But remember, he was born in, in, in 1888 or 1890. Anyways, uh, Paul Dudley White, a famous cardiologist, we know him from something called the Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome, a weird kind of funny heart people get. He did an autopsy on DeMar, and he'd run really till very late in life. And he had some plaque or you know fatty builds up and calcium buildup in his coronary arteries. But his coronary arteries were huge, were just massive. And subsequent to that, uh, a man named Bill Haskell out at Stanford in the middle 90s studied a bunch of ultra people who'd done ultra marathons. And they did the same thing, except this time they put catheters in and, and injected drugs to make the blood vessels expand. And they showed the blood vessels were bigger and they expanded more. So, so again, while you could still have some blockages, uh, even if you exercise, and there are people with horrible lipids, who do in fact get heart disease in spite of exercise. So it's not a complete, uh, you know, complete vaccine, but uh, its overall protective effect is, is quite large, uh, both in terms of what it does to people's lipids, but the fact that the blood vessels get so much bigger and the linings of the blood vessels are, are, are healthier. Mm -hmm.